Amen. It's good to be back with you tonight. Amen. Good to see you. And I appreciate your attendance tonight. Looking forward to the message and uh, continuance of our study here this evening, Israel, my glory. If you have God's word with you tonight, I'd ask you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. It's right after the book of Proverbs. If you need help with that, I know that's not a common reference for preachers to call, but it is part of God's word, and it is very important as it relates to the Bible and uh, the doctrine that Israel is given concerning their program and many things for us to learn from it as well. Ecclesiastes chapter number one, moving along in this section of doctrine in the Bible that we call the poetical books, the poetical section, uh, Job through Song of Solomon are those books that we're talking about and classifying as poetical or psalmish as we've called, called them in the past. And uh, some of those things um, as we're looking at uh, kind of a, a doctrinal gist um, type of teaching for those books, not going book, uh, verse by verse by any means, but just trying to get the doctrinal uh, sense and sequence of it and understand the role that it has in the edification of the believing remnant of Israel, especially as the Lord has now gone silent to the nation. When we're talking about the third installment of this fifth course of punishment, 400 years of silence that we're dealing with uh, between the ending of Malachi's prophecy and where Matthew picks up. And during that time, God's consigned them to the scriptures and um, has uh, told them to go consider what the former prophets have said. And so in some of the scriptures that have been written before, you've got the doctrinal <laughs> keys that they need to be coming to understand more and more as they progress through this time and get closer to the time when the Messiah is going to show up and be there in the land. And so we're trying to survey some of those things. We've summarized uh, really the doctrinal objectives thus far of the first three of these five books. We've talked about Job and Psalms and Proverbs last time. And so with those books covered, that brings us, of course, as we're just walking through it to Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon, and that will close out this poetical section. In the book of Job we saw that there's a tight in Job where the doctrinal gist communication of it is that it's describing Israel's satanic captivity and the suffering that they're experiencing under his hand. And Job found himself in a captivity and it's a typical lesson to the nation that they needed to be coming to understand. And then we followed that up with Psalms that describes the mechanical means of the Lord's name being implemented for Israel's salvation, right? The doctrine of the Christ the five mandates, the Davidic covenant that we reviewed last time, and how the son of David will come to provide the full salvation for his people. Uh, following that, we went into Proverbs last week, and we saw a book that describes to uh, the believers in Israel the wisdom in which they should walk as they dwell in the midst of the apostates in Israel. And we saw that contrast between the wisdom of God and the wisdom, the false wisdom of Israel's vain and apostate religious system and uh, the, the stark contrast as that's being laid out there to the believers in Israel there in Proverbs. And so we come to Ecclesiastes now, another book of Solomon. And in Ecclesiastes, what we're going to find is a description of the vanity of the wisdom of the world. A description of the vanity of the wisdom of the world. Uh, once again, that principle that we've alluded to and talked about in weeks past about the sense and the sequence of God's word comes into play here, I think. Uh, because we realize that when we come into Ecclesiastes, we are coming out of Proverbs and those doctrinal lessons that we dealt with last time. And in Proverbs, it had set forth to the nation the wisdom of God. Right? Proverbs is that book of wisdom. And he's taught them the wisdom of God. And he's talked about the preserving benefits that come to them as a nation if they'll walk in the wisdom of God. It'll deliver them from the evil man and from the strange woman and from that path that leads to destruction. And there's preserving benefits if they'll hearken and, and heed the wisdom of God and walk therein. And that's been set forth in the Proverbs. And Proverbs has also made it abundantly clear that as they're doing that, there's going to be counterfeit wisdom that's offered to them and a, a competing and opposing wisdom to the wisdom of God that's trying to pull them away and entice them. And they've been charged in Proverbs that when sinners entice thee, you can set thou not. You stay with the wisdom of God and you stay away from this wisdom of the world and the wisdom of men. And so having laid out the wisdom of God in Proverbs, it would make sense that having taught that, he would follow that up now in Ecclesiastes and he would 
highlight the issue of the wisdom of the world, right? That which stands in contrast and contradiction to the wisdom of God and the, the preserving benefits of that wisdom that Proverbs taught. Ecclesiastes is going to show them the vanity of the wisdom of men. And if you don't walk in God's wisdom and you choose the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of religion, uh, the human wisdom, to boil it down to that, the wisdom of man, if you walk in that, that's all vanity and vexation of spirit, you'll say. And so Ecclesiastes is the book that's going to come along and really highlight that for those that are searching the scriptures, showing them and exposing to them the vanity of walking in human wisdom. And so we'll see that, the wisdom of men and its vanity. And that's certainly something that the believers of the nation needed to be coming to understand as these 400 years are progressing along. There's going to be some counterfeit wisdom, as we've talked about already, that is also getting developed, and that's just uh, growing, and it's, it's uh, tradition, and it's vanity, that vain religious system in Israel, just growing and, and growing, that's apart from the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the law. And those that are believers in Jehovah, and uh, those that are believers of the Scripture, really need to be having their senses discerned to understand that all this wisdom that's in the tradition and the, the vain system really is it's just all vanity, and its end is destruction. And so Ecclesiastes is a, a book that's set forth to teach them that, and it'll become more and more significant as time progresses on into the fourth installment and the fifth installment out there at the end as they get nearer and nearer to the time of the kingdom. And so an important lesson for them to learn. Now, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time in Ecclesiastes tonight, nor Song of Solomon for that matter. I do want to touch on these. And, but we're not going to spend a lot of time, and that's not because the books are unimportant. It's not because the doctrinal lessons of them are less significant. They are important, and they have great bearing, as I've already tried to highlight. But I'm just going to hit these, these books pretty quickly tonight because I think that the summary statements that I'm going to give you are going to serve a, a sufficient function to give us that doctrinal gist that we need for this period of time and just kind of see how the books fit in and the general message that they're conveying that Israel needed to be learning at this time. And so the summary statement for Ecclesiastes, once again, it describes the vanity of the wisdom of the world, or human wisdom, as it's found under the sun and apart from God. Let me repeat that. Describes the vanity of the wisdom of the world as it's found under the sun, apart from God. If you look here in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. In those intro verses here of the book, you can see that the work is identified with the preacher, the son of David. He's king in Jerusalem. That would be none other than Solomon. And so we're talking about a, a work here in Ecclesiastes that was penned back here in the interlude of mercy and blessing once again. Solomon was the one that penned down the Proverbs and also the Ecclesiastes here that he's talking about is by this son of David, king in Jerusalem. This is King Solomon. And he calls himself the preacher here. He's going to be preaching some things as it relates to what he said in verse number two, the preacher declares, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That's quite an optimistic start to a book, isn't it? I mean, that's an optimistic outlook if you've ever seen one. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Everything is vain. That's actually pretty pessimistic, isn't it? Pretty depressing when you think about it. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, the reason that Solomon is saying that is because he's looking at all of man's labors with a key phrase here, under the sun. Right? Man dwells on the earth under the sun. And he's looking at all the works of man that is done under the sun. And as he's evaluating that and looking at the very best that man can do on the earth under the sun and apart from God, the conclusion that he comes to is that everything that man can produce is vanity. It's the very best that, that the very best that man can hope for, apart from God's purpose. 
Everything that a man does in the world is very short-lived and worthless when you think about it. No lasting profits. James will come along later and he'll talk about our life. You know, what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. I'm only here for a short time. And there's some men in their lifetime, they've accomplished what would amount to, in human terms, great things, right? Accomplished a lot of things in the short duration of their time. But the great equalizer of mankind is whether you're rich, whether you're of social influence or how wise you are, the great equalizer of mankind is that ultimately death comes to all, doesn't it? Amen. The rich and poor both face death. And in the casket, regardless of how much the casket costs, there's still death that's come to the person laying in it. Death comes to all. And so when you look at that from a, 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 a human standpoint, right, if somebody lived 100 years and accomplished great things and amassed great wealth and, and were, were thought of uh, very well in society and had great influence in society, and then they come down to the end of their days and they die, it all passes away. One generation passeth away and another generation comes. And Solomon's looking at that and he's evaluating that and thinking about it he said, really, all this is just vanity. Very short-lived and worthless. And, you know, regardless of what a man acquires in his lifetime, it really doesn't profit him in the long run because death comes to all. And all that you lay up for yourself, all that you would acquire in your lifetime is just going to be passing to another generation. And he'll come along and say, who knows whether they'll be wise or foolish. Right? You work your whole life, you do the right thing, and you, you build up this wealth, and you, then you die, and it goes to the next generation, and they squander it. Yeah. Riots is living, and foolishness, they, they waste all of that. He said, What's the point? Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Yeah. See? Life's meaningless, it's worthless. It's very short lived. Skip down to verse 12. He says, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. I communed with my own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate. And I've gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart and my, uh, excuse me, yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. He's talking about all the wisdom and the wealth that he's acquired. And he's, he's come to the conclusion that it's all vanity. And we're not talking about a pauper here. We're not talking about a poor man. This is Solomon, right? We looked at all the glory and the riches of Solomon and all that he had coming to him year by year and how the Queen of Sheba talked about how that she couldn't believe how, uh, how glorious he was back in her own land and how she had to come and see it for herself. And when she got there and she saw it, what'd she say? And the half wasn't even told me. The wisest man, God put wisdom into his heart. He said, I had more wisdom than all that were in Jerusalem before me. More wealth, more riches, more servants, more glory and esteem. And, and men thought well of me. I'm the king in Israel. And yet, when I look at it and I see it, all of its vanity mm. means nothing. All is vanity. Quite a conclusion to come to, isn't it? They say that Money doesn't buy happiness. All right, there's some truth in that. Doesn't buy peace. Yeah, a lot of times it does buy misery. And Solomon and all his wealth and glory has come to the conclusion that all is vanity when he looks at what man accomplishes that's apart from God. In this book, Solomon goes on to describe the various kinds of vanities of the wisdom of men. And he talks about a number of these things in detail that we've already kind of summarized tonight. Wealth and wisdom and that type of thing. Influence. He describes the vanities in this book. And then you come over to chapter 12 here and notice the conclusion that he comes to. After 
after talking about all this vanity of the wisdom of man, he comes down to the final conclusion. The conclusion of the whole matter, he'll say. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In view of the fact that all the work of man will finally be brought into God's judgment, anything done under the sun apart from God's purpose, Solomon says, it's all vanity. And if that's true, and it is, if all is vanity, to overly concern ourselves with the wisdom of men in this world is an exercise in futility, isn't it? To be overly concerned with the wisdom of men in this world is futility. It's vanity. And that's something that we all can learn from, right? There's still a wisdom of men that's going on today. <laughs> Don't be overly concerned with the wisdom of the world. Seek that which is of God, right? The power and the wisdom of God in the gospel that we talked about on Sunday. That's where true wisdom is. But that's the lesson that also the believers in Israel needed to be edified in. They need to be coming to a comprehension of that starting here in this third installment. As they're going through those 400 years and all this counterfeit wisdom is being brought up, they need to be able to recognize the vanity of all that. The tradition and the religion is worthless. It means nothing to God. That's not the wisdom after which we order our steps. It's all vanity. And it's headed for destruction. Amen. And that, that lesson will have continual bearings. It starts here. It's got bearing in the gospel period. It'll have a lot of bearing out here at the end as they proceed headed toward the kingdom. And that kingdom being at hand, they're going to have to make judgments about that wisdom. And so Ecclesiastes then is a book that's meant for the edification of the remnant for, to bring them to a, a comprehension of the vanity of the wisdom of men. Walk and order your steps in the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of the world. And that brings us to the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Not another work of Solomon that we have before us as we move out of Ecclesiastes. You go to Song of Solomon chapter 1, you should be there, right across the page from where we just read. And this book is a, it's a series of songs that conveys a love story, for lack of a better way to describe it. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon, conveying a love story. There's a Shulamite woman who's earnestly awaiting the coming of her beloved. She'll talk of her beloved in this book. She's waiting on his coming. And as she's waiting for her beloved one, she's encountered and she's seduced by a series of advances from a worldly king. That worldly king is one of great riches, and influence and power typified by Solomon in my understanding of this book at present. But she's enticed. There's great temptations that are brought upon this woman to entice her to leave off the faithful waiting of her beloved one and his return and, and to wait for her espoused one. And there's temptation for her to falter in her endurance and to succumb to the advances of this worldly king. And you see that worked out in the various songs that's laid out in this book. If we pick up here in chapter 1, verse 1, Song of Solomon 1, 1, the song of songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers, we will be glad and rejoice in thee and will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. Now as the book starts out with the first song of songs, as it were, you see this woman who is reminiscent of her beloved one who is away at this time. She's remembering. She's thinking on him. She remembers the sweetness of his love when they were together. She remembers and she's thinking on what she calls uh, this, this good ointment of thy name as poured forth. She's, she's remembering that love as though it's a sweet savor, a precious savor and fragrance when she thinks on his name, right? 
She's thinking about that, and she's reminiscing of that, and, and she's thinking about him, and she's doing that, at least as I understand this, because she's been seized in the absence of her beloved one, and she's been brought into the king's chambers, as it says in verse 4. The king hath brought me into his chambers. While her beloved is away, the king has brought her in. She's been seized and brought in, and he's bringing her in in order to try to allure her away from the love that she has for her beloved, right? To, to impress, as it were, with the chamber and the curtains and all the glory of the palace, to, to woo her away from the steadfast waiting for her beloved one and be enticed to go after another. And so this worldly king's attempting to draw her away. You'll find in the Song of Solomon that there's a couple of advances of the king to try to get her to uh, not hold fast in her commitment. To not be faithful in her waiting for the return of her beloved. And each time that there's an advance of the worldly king to draw her away, she'll resist that and she'll not succumb to the great temptation. And, and primarily the way that she does that is by keeping her mind stayed on her beloved. Hmm. And while the temptation's there and, and the pool is there, and the, 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 the wealth and the riches that would draw her away and that she might would, would covet after, the way she doesn't succumb to that great temptation is she keeps her mind stayed on her beloved. She thinks about him. And the nearness and the, the at-handedness, if you will, of his return. And as her mind is stayed upon him, she's able to stay off the advances of the worldly king. You see one example of that if you go over to chapter 7. This is how she's resisting it. Of course, the, the king has been uh, putting out the, the seductions, the advances, and the verses leading up to this, but she resists it by what she says here in verse 10 of chapter 7. She says, I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early in, uh, to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine flourish, whether the tender grape appear and the pomegranates bud forth. There will I give thee my loves. The mandrakes give a smell, and at our gates are all manner of pleasant fruits, new and old, which I have laid up for thee, O oh, my beloved. She's minding her beloved there. That's how she's staying off the previously described advances of the kings and then of the king. And then finally, chapter eight, as he closes out the book, at the end of it all, her beloved comes for her. She's resisted the temptation. She's not succumbed to it. And then finally her beloved comes. And as she does that, she gives the final word, so to speak, to this, as she's speaking to Solomon. And talking to Solomon, finally rejecting Solomon's vineyard to go into the vineyard of her beloved. And essentially her attitude toward Solomon is going to be, you know, you have your vineyards, I have mine. Right? And she goes away with her beloved into the vineyard. Chapter 8, verse 10, she says, I am a wall and my breasts like towers. Then was I in his eyes as one that found favor. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He let out the vineyard unto keepers. Everyone for the fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, which is mine, is before me. Thou, O Solomon, must have a thousand, and those that keep the fruit thereof two hundred. Thou that dwellest in the gardens, the companions hearken to thy voice, cause me to hear it. Make haste, my beloved, and be thou like to a roe or to a young heart upon the mountains of spices. She looks at all the glory of the worldly king and all his thousands of vineyards, and she says, you can have your vineyards, I've got mine. She esteems the vineyard of her beloved and goes after that. Now, that's all fine and well when it comes to the immediate situation of what's being described there, but we understand that this section is put here for a doctrinal function. And the doctrinal function of this book, as it relates to Israel, is through a typical picture to give them a, a description of the joy of the believing remnant in Israel as they are faithfully awaiting the coming of their espoused one, the Messiah. 
And they're going to have to do that in the face of great temptations to be drawn away by a worldly king. Now, that's, that's true here when we're talking about it. It's got to function here because what they're doing at this time through these 400 years is they're waiting for the coming of the Messiah. Right? He comes here at the end of the 62 weeks, near the end of it. They're waiting for him. And there are going to be some great temptations of that worldly wisdom during this time that they're having to face as they're anticipating his coming. But it's even going to be more significant as the program moves along because out here at the end, there is going to be a worldly king that's trying to seduce them away from a steadfast stand and a faith in Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. Now, I'm not going to say too much more about that as far as the, the typical picture of it. As we go along and we look at some other things, that typical picture will become clearer and clearer to them. But right now, all I'm trying to do is give you the gist of it so that you understand there's significance in the type of what's going on here in relation to their waiting for their beloved one, mm -hmm. waiting for the Messiah, the Lord to come unto them. And they're going to be called upon to be steadfast and faithful in the face of the great temptations. They're going to be coming upon them. Okay? And so it's preparing believers for what's going to be coming in the program as we move forward. I think that's sufficient for the poetical books. You can see how that grouping together contained doctrinal significance for what they needed to be coming to learn all through this time and it just has more and more bearing as the program moves along. All right, so that concludes the poetical section. That brings us to the next section of books here before we get to the gospel period, and that is, of course, the books of the writing prophets. Okay? The writing prophets. The writing prophets, of course, are comprised of the books of Isaiah through Malachi. Okay? It's about 17 works there, 17 writings of books by the writing prophets. Now, this learning aspect that we've been talking about, you know, the, the learning aspect of key doctrines in anticipation of the coming of Messiah, that learning function continues out of the poetical books and into the prophets. The prophets have a doctrinal edification purpose for those that are seeking the scripture during this period of time as well. Okay, so that's going to continue. There's nothing changing about that as they're anticipating the coming of Messiah in the gospel period. However, it's a little bit different than the poetical section in that the prophets utilize in their teaching what I'm going to call threads of prophetic themes in order to teach. There's a variety of themes that the prophets will deal with, but the way that they deal with them is not by giving you a chapter that lays out every detail about a particular subject before moving on. There's, there's threads that's got to be traced through all these prophets here from Isaiah to Malachi. And there's certain themes and threads that each one of these prophets will pick up on, and God will utilize them to layer in more detail as you work through it. There's almost a, a looping, if you will, to the doctrine. They'll teach you a little bit about it, and then come back later on, lay in some more detail, and there's almost a looping to the doctrine as they're going through it. And so what that means in a practical sense is that in order to learn the doctrinal themes within the prophets, you have to look at what is said across all the prophets to get a full picture of the doctrine that's being conveyed. Because you're not going to find it just in one chapter, everything that there is to know. God uses all the prophets to communicate truth, and you can trace those threads through all those books. Okay, We're going to deal with some of those themes get into some of those next week, but uh, before we get into the themes, I think that it's important knowing that all the prophets are dealing with these threads to kind of have an understanding of the way that the prophets are broken down and they kind of have that bird's eye view, so to speak, lay of the land for what you have in the prophets before you start drilling into getting some of the doctrinal content that they're dealing with. And so what I want to do in the last few minutes here tonight is give you a couple of breakdowns of these 17 works of the prophets and talk about how to look at those when you come to the Bible and these books in this section that we're calling the prophets, okay? So the first division that we want to talk about is what I'm calling the size division. And this is probably the most common division that you'll hear when someone talks about the books of the prophets. There's major prophets, and then there's minor prophets, okay? And that determination of what's a major prophet and what is a minor prophet 
Primarily, all that that has to do with is the length of the work. Right? There's some prophetic books that are much longer. Right? Isaiah's got 66 chapters. I think Jeremiah has, uh, what is it, 50? 52? Somewhere in that. These major prophets. And the major prophets, I should probably identify for you, are these first ones here. They're, they come first in the Bible. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, which is a work of Jeremiah. Ezekiel, and Daniel. Okay? So the red check mark books there are what we consider the major prophets. Isaiah to Daniel. The rest of these books, from Hosea over to Malachi, all of these, and we'll check in blue, these are the minor prophets. And they're much shorter, which you can verify yourself just by looking at the length of the book. You just flip through it. You'll see... Some of these books uh, have one chapter. You know, some have two or three or four. They're minor in respect to some of these other prophets that are major and have a lot more material, okay? Now, that breakdown is, again, primarily size-driven, but I do think that there's some validity, doctrinally speaking, to that breakdown, too, because what you'll see in the progression of these prophetic themes that we're talking about is that the major prophets are the ones that are used to lay the foundational doctrine, right? They're the ones that's going to introduce you to all these threads of, of prophetic teaching. And they'll hit on pretty much all the themes to some degree or another. All of it's laid down in the major prophets. And then after you get that foundational understanding, what God has the minor prophets do is he'll come back and he'll start amplifying on certain details, layering in more details on the foundation of the major prophets so that as you work your way through Isaiah to Malachi, you're constantly going over these things and you're getting more and more detail each time that a subject is dealt with by the prophets. And so we've got major and minor prophets here in these books, okay? Now, the one other division that I think is important to take note of, especially as you're dealing with the content of the books, it's not driven by size, but it's driven by our timeline. And the timeline's been a big issue in this study, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. We've just been tracing it through. We've got the timeline drawn up here. You can break down these books of the prophets according to our timeline. There's prophets here in these works that we're going to call first installment prophets. And then there's other prophets that we call second installment prophets. Okay. Now, why do we call them that? Well, we're talking about the fifth course of punishment. All of the prophets are fifth course of punishment prophets. We've learned that this fifth uh, course of punishment is divided up into sections, right? Daniel chapter 9 we looked at. The 70 weeks of division, we've identified one, two, three, four, five installments that we've been talking about in this fifth course of punishment. Okay, The prophet's burden is concerned with things that are going on in this fifth course of punishment. Now, historically, the prophets, when they're raised up and they're prophesying in Israel, there were some that began to be raised up here in the fourth installment as they're headed to the fifth, and some that are still ministering after some of the captivities take place. But there's prophets that were raised up by God primarily to deal with issues in the first installment. And then there's other prophets that were raised up later on in this second installment, with the return with Ezra and Nehemiah, the rebuilding of the temple and the wall that we talked about, there's some prophets that were raised up during this time. We call those second installment prophets. Now, the vast majority of the prophets are first installment prophets, okay? So, actually, if I can block these out here, these last three. These final three are the second installment prophets. Everything else is the first installment prophet, Okay? So we'll put second, and all the rest of these are first installment prophets. So again, what does that mean? That means that Isaiah through Zephaniah are raised up and write their works as the captivities are coming, or either right after they've taken place at some point. Later on, God raises up the last three, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, during the time when the return and rebuilding is going on, the second installment prophets, okay? And you can discern that by the details of the books. You remember, may remember, as we were coming through some of the history back here, and we were talking about those judgments that characterize the courses of punishment, 
I took you to the prophets several times, didn't I? We were looking forward to the captivities. We went to passages in Jeremiah. We talked about Daniel. We went to Isaiah. I was able to do that because of an understanding of this breakdown that there's first installment prophets. I know where to look for information that's related to this first installment. It's going to be in Isaiah through Zephaniah. First installment prophets. And then when we were talking about Ezra and Nehemiah and the rebuilding work, we looked at passages in Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi because historically, that's where they're fitting. And so the time that line breakdown becomes very significant when you're trying to deal with the contents. When you know the first and second installment prophets and how that divides out, you know where to put their prophecy contextually on the timeline. I know what I'm dealing with. I know what they're writing about and why they're writing about it, right? Malachi is not writing about things back here related to the coming of the Babylonians. Historically, that's already happened. He's raised up later, but he is concerned with things related to that temple, related to the people that have gone back to the land after those captivities. And so knowing that, that timeline breakdown of the prophets helps you know how to layer them in and place them and to be able to deal with the doctrinal themes that they, they deal with. And so that's, that's really important when it comes to getting a 10,000-foot view, as it were, and you're looking down on it to know how it lines up. And when you have that framework to under, of understanding... You're then able to go into that doctrine and start extracting those threads and see how that all fits together and how they actually complement one another. All right, they don't write necessarily chronologically, historically speaking, but the doctrinal theme is there and God in his wisdom just weaves all that together so that it develops these themes and communicates this truth to Israel that impacts them not only for the immediate, but they talk about things that's coming out here in the third and the fourth and the fifth installments. And Israel has a roadmap that's going to come along and Messiah is going to amplify upon when you get over there to the Gospels. And so this learning is continuing. I know that's kind of a bridge type of message that we're at there, going between the poetical books to the prophetic books. But hopefully that basis of getting the breakdown of the way that those prophets fall helps us serve as a foundation as we come back next week and start looking at some of those threads of doctrine that they're going to be taught. And we're not going to look at all of them. I want to pick out a few of the key issues from the prophets and try to highlight some of those next time. Amen? Amen. Hope that makes sense to you. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we're thankful for the time tonight. We thank you for the word. And Father, I pray that as we've endeavored tonight to lay out some structure to the things that we're going to build upon in the weeks to come, that this would serve us well. And that as we read these uh, prophetic books of Rome, that we'd be able to uh, look at them and view them from the, the timeline perspective of what you were doing with these men. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to communicate it to the saints and to collectively learn together and to edify one another in these things. We give you thanks and the praise in Christ's name.